glorious Easter. The, the, the sun's come out. It's wonderful, isn't it? It's great to see so many of you here this morning. If you're a visitor, you're very welcome. If you're always here, you're just as welcome. And welcome to those who watch us later. The ones up that watch us later on don't realise it's actually a cast of thousands in the church this morning. <laughs> just all tucked under the balcony, so you can't see them. It is really a joyous day and please feel welcome here. Um, and just a couple of informations. One that I have to tell you, we have an annual state meeting next Sunday morning immediately after the service. It won't take long, but please do stay with us. And this morning after the service, you're all welcome to join us across the church hall for bacon and egg rolls, uh, biscuits, tea, coffee. Malcolm has been busy doing stuff, so um, please come and join us. Catch up with old friends, make new friends, do whichever you like. But it's wonderful for us all to come together as a family on Easter Sunday. So welcome and please join with me in the call to worship this morning. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Darkness has been banished. The brilliant light of the world has come. Come, let us worship and celebrate the good news. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Amen. So let us begin our worship by singing exactly that. Him 410, Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. 411. <laughs>
the prison of fear, the pain of humiliation, the loneliness of rejection, but you also found that love was stronger than fear. Just as you came risen and unexpected to those first friends of yours, who went to the garden, anxious and fearful, be with us now and touch us with your peace. Gracious God, we pray in sorrow for the ways we go wrong in our lives, the ways we fail in our witness to your love. We have journeyed through Lent, attempting to shape our lives around the compassion and courage of Christ. Yet we have heard in our hearts the impulses of those who deny Jesus, betray him and mocked him. Forgive us for the ways we have abandoned the path of love and justice. And yet we trust in your grace, your forgiveness and your acceptance flowing from the cross. Your joy shared in resurrection life. Help us to live lives liberated from guilt and inspired to follow your risen Son. God of power and love, we give you thanks that you raised your Son, Jesus Christ, from the grave, that you caused his tomb to be empty, that you gave hope by your presence. We thank you that the powers of evil, which seem to overcome all light and goodness and love on Friday, were themselves overcome on this day, defeated in your Son's rising. We thank you that in Christ's rising we have hope for life before and beyond death, <coughs> inspiration for our lives as witnesses to your grace, comfort for pain, and faith in place of fear. We thank you for every sign of resurrection we sense by your Spirit. In nature as the seasons slowly turn, in society as your kingdom makes its way, in our lives as anxieties give way to peace. And now we join our voices together with believers around the world to pray as Jesus taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. This is calling comes out to meet the first Bible reading. Can I say thank you to all those who brought flowers this morning to decorate the church. They are wonderful and it gives us a good sense of springtime. So thank you to everyone for doing that. <coughs>
Now this is where you've spotted my first deliberate mistake this morning. There may be others, but this is the deliberate one. Uh, this is not HIM 415, but 416, as you see on the board there. So HIM 416, uh, Christ is alive with Christian sin, 416.
sometimes my want. Um, I'd like to retell the gospel story with a, a children's version of it. And since we are here, and since it is, we are all children today, because I defy any of you not to get excited about a chocolate egg at some point in the day. Oh, I'm not telling tales out of school. Susan may have something for you later as you leave. But let me tell you the story you just heard from the Gospel in a slightly different way. It was very early and the birds were still in bed. And the sun had not yet opened its bright eye in the world. The sky was grey and grainy. The air was cold. And three women walked across the graveyard. Jesus was worried there and the women were coming to visit his grave. They talked in sad whispers. They cried. They held each other's hands. Jesus had been dead for three days and they missed him very much. Just as they reached the graveyard, something surprising happened. The ground began to shake, the air began to tremble, and quick as lightning, an angel flashed down from heaven and rolled the stone away from, stone away from Jesus' tomb. Everything went quiet. The ground stopped moving, but the women shook in fear. Don't be afraid, the angel said. Come and see. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Arm in arm, the women crept past the angel and into the tomb. The sheets were still there. The sheets they had around his dead body, but Jesus himself had gone. Where is he? The women asked. What have you done with him? I told you, smiled the angel. He's not dead anymore. He's come back to life. And he wants you to tell all his friends. The women looked at each other. They didn't know whether to laugh or cry. They could hardly believe it. That is, until they hurried out of the tomb and straight into Jesus himself. Oh Jesus, they cried. It's true, you're alive. And they fell at his feet amazed. There's no need to be afraid anymore, he said. God has made everything all right. But I have a job for you. I want you to tell the rest of my friends that I am alive. Tell them that I will meet them elsewhere in Galilee, where all our adventures began. The women waved goodbye and hurried off to Jerusalem. The birds were seen now. The sun's bright sky was wide open and they had the most amazing story to tell. Amen. Sometimes hearing it through the ears of children is so much more powerful. Let us sing again from the hymn book. <coughs> hymn 412. The strike is for the battle one. 412.
for those of you who are not regulars here, I, since the war in Ukraine, the conflict began for over two years ago now, I've had prayers for peace in this part of the service every Sunday morning. And strangely, we've had more reason to pray for peace in the last few months than ever before. So I take prayers from different communities, different places, uh, to focus our minds on events beyond our own shores, as well as those that affect us directly. And this morning's prayer for peace is taken from the CBS News website in the United States and was written by the Reverend Sharon Kugler, the chaplain at Yale University in New, New Haven, Connecticut. It was originally broadcast on Easter 2022, but it's incredibly relevant and I've adapted it in light of recent events. Let us pray. We have been living with a deep burden of global unrest, uncertainty, grief, and fear that is starting to feel brutally defined in its staying power. Our spirits are suffering under the stress of it all. And now here we are gathered in this imperfect way across these many different ways of connection, longing for reasons to hope, longing for multiple kinds of peace. What can we do thousands of miles away from a new war, a new invasion to bring peace? Let us pray for peace. Peace in Ukraine where people are fleeing, hiding or losing their very lives in defence of their homes and their way of life. Peace in the Holy Land where people are being held against their will or losing their lives, their homes and their very existence. Peace in all places where aggression, poverty, <coughs> ignorance and violence oppresses and destroys our human family. Peace in our aching hearts, so that we can be part of the kind of healing that is restorative. Peace in our minds to create a more just world. Peace in the light, peace in the dark, peace in the big and peace in the small, peace in the weak and peace in the strong. May you be shalom. May you be Salah, may you be Shanti, may you bring and be peace. Amen. Let us sing again in the hymn book, hymn 426, all heaven declares, 4, 2, 6.
Can you even begin to imagine the pain the two Marys and Salome must have been feeling as they walked towards the tomb? They were going to perform the rituals that have always been done for those who have died. Their hearts must be full to bursting with grief and dread as they expected a rough reception from the, the soldiers guarding the tomb. We can never really place ourselves in their shoes because we know things they couldn't possibly imagine. We have the testimony of them themselves, the women who first discovered that Jesus was alive. And then we have the testimony of the disciples who came after. They only knew what they had seen at Golgotha and been told by Jesus in those last days. But being told something is one thing. Believing it is much harder when you've just seen the reality of the crucifixion. So you can imagine the impact of them arriving at the tomb, seeing that the stone had been rolled away, and that instead of the body of Jesus laid out on the platform, another person entirely is sat upright and very much alive. The message he gives them is even more surprising and dramatic, that Jesus is no longer dead, but is risen from the grave, and is waiting to meet them. It is often overlooked that the first people to discover that Jesus had risen were the women who followed him, not the disciples. Once again, the message of the Gospels is that Jesus is not just for those who the world regards as important. It is for everyone, male or female, powerful or powerless, wealthy or poverty-stricken, young or old. Only now is the reality of Jesus' resurrection beginning to hit home with the women as they hurried back to tell the disciples. And Mark's Gospel goes on to tell us the following. Jesus rose from the dead early on the first day of the week. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene. She went and told those who had been with him. She found them crying. They were very sad. They heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, but they did not believe it. After that, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them, and this happened while we were walking in the country. The two returned and told the others about it, but the others did not believe them either. And later, Jesus appeared to the eleven disciples as they were eating. He spoke firmly to them because they had no faith. They would not believe those who had seen him after he rose from the dead. As I said when we began following Mark's Gospel at the beginning of the church year, the writer of this Gospel doesn't spend a long time on detail, so we get a very sparse version of the resurrection story. We jump from the grave site to the story of the road to Emmaus and on to the first encounter in the upper room. The Gospel writer also highlights the disbelief so many had in the, in the, struggle, the struggles they faced in the first days. So now we move on to Peter. And he picks up the story in his speech to those who met with him at the house of Cornelius, the Roman centurion in Joppa. Peter was one of those men who struggled in those first days. Peter was one of them who denied Jesus on the night of his arrest. And now he is telling the world about the mission of Jesus. The mission he had been given by Jesus in the period immediately after the resurrection. We know from the other Gospels that Jesus spent many weeks with the disciples after the resurrection, teaching them and preparing them for the time when he would no longer be with them in physical form. So as Peter tells of the mission Jesus has given the disciples, he is doing so in the home of a man who he would never have entered before the resurrection. 
For a Jew to physically step into the house of a Gentile was forbidden. And yet here he is, baptizing a Roman soldier, staying in the house of a Roman, a Gentile, eating the same food from the same table as them, all unheard of. But the resurrection had changed Peter's worldview completely. Everything about his world had been turned upside down by Jesus and the resurrection. And he tells the world this new faith he's found that would take him to places he never imagined when he first met Jesus on the shores of Lake Galilee. The message of that Easter morning is as relevant to us today as it was to the women at the graveside and the disciples who rushed after them that morning. Jesus' gospel message is for everyone who opens their hearts and their minds to believe in Him. And our task is to continue that work begun on the first Easter day. That work begun by the women at the grave. We must proclaim the gospel to anyone who is willing to listen. Not just those we know and have already heard, but to those who have not heard this message at all. Many people today will paint and roll boiled eggs down slopes and get to receive chocolate eggs and eat lamb without realising the significance of all these symbols. So our task is to explain their true significance and celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. So today, whether you be rich or poor, young or old, male or female, free or slaves, celebrate our Lord's resurrection. Celebrate the Easter, that first Easter and every Easter since then. And wherever you are, tell the true significance of these symbols and that the hope they offer through Jesus' sacrifice and the miracle his father performed in breaking down the barriers of death to offer eternal life to all who believe in him. Amen. May God add his blessing to these words. Let us sing again that great hymn of Easter, hymn 438, the head that once was crowned in thorns. Four,
bring your prayers for dedication for the world. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we bring our offerings to you for dedication, we bring ourselves as well. To be your eyes and ears, your hands and feet, serving and praising your name in all we do. Bless us and bless our offerings, that we may in turn be a blessing to you. Blessed are you, God and Father of us all, giver of life and life eternal. By the love of your Son you have triumphed over hatred. In his power, light has conquered darkness, and light has overcome death. You have opened for us the gate of eternal life. Blessed are you, O God, now and forever. Lord, we are the Easter people. Let Alleluia be our song. We give you thanks and praise for the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and for his appearances to his loved ones. We rejoice with the whole church in the joy of the risen Lord. May we know the good news. Go and tell others that he has risen and grant that your church may help to bring peace and hope in a troubled world. We ask you to give courage to all who have not seen and yet still believe. Risen Lord, we seek your peace. Peace for a war-torn world. Peace between nations and people. Peace in our dealings with each other. Peace in our hearts and in our homes. As you appear to the disciples in the house, come enter our homes. Come enter into our fear and darkness. Come enter into our enclosed lives and our fear to venture out too far. Come with the glorious freedom you offer to the children of God. We come with all who weep by gravesides. All who mourn the loss of loved ones, all who feel lonely or deserted, may all who mourn find new hope and joy in you. We remember all who are terminally ill and those who are caring for them. We think of those who have a heavy weight in their hearts and minds and tears in their eyes. We ask that we may all know the hope of eternal life. And now, Lord, in the silence of our hearts, we bring before you all those we know of in need of your care, your compassion, your comfort, and your love at this time.
May Easter's incredible joy fill you. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always.